episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome uh, again to another episode of our show with another truly fascinating guest who is involved in a variety of areas, uh, creating a better tomorrow for all of us. Uh, we have the honor today of being joined by Dr. Tim Lasky, who is Vice President of Research and Business Development for the Cardiac Ablation Solutions business uh, at the Medtronic Company. Uh, Dr. Lasky is a Medtronic Bakken Fellow, named after uh, Earl Bakken, who uh, founded Medtronic and developed the first uh, pacemaker back in 1957. He's also a technical fellow and a fellow of the American Institute for Medical and Biological Engineering. Uh, Dr. Lasky's previous roles at Medtronic include Vice President of Product Development for Cardiac Ablation Solutions, Senior Product Development Director Director for Heart Valves, Senior Program Director for Cayenne's Catheter Heart Valves, Technology Director for Cardiac Rhythm Therapy Delivery, and various technology management design engineering positions in the tech arrhythmia lead development uh, area. Uh, prior to his tenure at Medtronic, Dr. Lasky worked as a design engineer at Ford Motor Company in Detroit in crash safety and advanced vehicle systems engineering. Uh, Dr. Lasky has a bachelor's degree in both biologic sciences and mechanical engineering from Michigan Technological University, his master's degree uh, in mechanical engineering from University of Michigan, and his PhD in biomedical engineering from the University of Minnesota, uh, where he currently serves as adjunct associate professor in the Department of Surgery. Uh, his doctoral research was centered on the use of isolated working hard in the design of medical devices, and in parallel, uh, co-founded the company Visible Heart Laboratory. Uh, in addition to medical device design and cardiac physiology, his current research interests uh, include the study of hibernation physiology, uh, particularly in wild black bear and brown bear populations, and we're going to be discussing that. Uh, Dr. Lasky has more than 80 U.S. patents, numerous publications in the field of biomedical engineering uh, and wildlife biology and ecology. Uh, and as a little background for our non-U.S. Uh, guests, although Although it's a pretty, pretty big company, Medtronic is one of, if not the largest medical device company in the world. It's operating in 140 different countries, employs about 100,000 people uh, with annual revenues of $30 billion. Uh, Dr. Tim Lasky, thanks so much for taking the time to come on the show today. Yeah, thank you, Ira. It's a pleasure to be here. It's, it's a pleasure having you. And um, uh, typically, you know, we start things off by giving our guests the floor for a little bit just to talk about themselves. Um, if you could take us on a little bit on your journey and, you know, uh, thank you very much ahead of time for sending me your, your CV. And I just, I, I wanted to, if you could start off because I noticed back in, I think it was 1982, uh, you weren't doing any of this. You were studying wolf and moose ecology. Uh, and I'd love if, you know, you could sort of start us off there and take us through the automotive industry, medical device and sort of now things are coming full circle for you. So I think that'd be a great way to start off. Absolutely. Um, so it all started for me. I, I grew up in a very small town in Southern Michigan and my father was a school teacher. The town was 900 uh, people. The school was in our backyard. So I walked to school every day for uh, 13 years. And when uh, my two brothers and I wanted to play, we just jumped the fence because the baseball diamonds and uh, the playground was, was right over our, our backyard fence. We also had um, a lot of outdoors areas around us, a lake behind us. We loved to ski, camp, hike, and do things in the outdoors. And so growing up, I very much was interested in uh, animals, wildlife conservation. And uh, that's where my, my love for uh, research started and what led to the Wolf Moose Project. Uh, my parents were both very much focused on education and supporting our interests. And uh, as I mentioned, my father was a teacher. Uh, while my brothers and I were in college, my mother was in college as well. She initially worked at the Foundling Hospital in New York City and then um, stopped working to raise us and then went back to school and, and subsequently became a teacher. So uh, the four of us were in college at the same time. I went to Michigan Tech and um, was very much interested in wildlife biology. And there's a, a bit of a backstory on that. One of the places we would go backpacking was Isle Royal, which is one of the least visited national parks. It's in Lake Superior off the shore of Canada. And on one of the trips on the boat ride back, I met a young man who was a research assistant on the Wolf Project. And I thought to myself, that is the coolest job that anyone could ever have. And um, when I applied for colleges, I applied to Michigan Tech, Michigan and um, Michigan State and went to Michigan Tech with the dream of somehow getting engaged in this project. And I went there uh, studying biology initially and in my freshman biology class, 
uh, lo and behold, they announced that there was an opening on the Wolf Project. And I called home to my father. Um, it was my, part of my journey, it was a journey of gaining self-confidence. And at the time, I called my father and said, well, they have an opening on the project, but I would never get the job. And my father was really upset with me. He says, what are you talking about? <laughs> As he, I'd spent time on Isle Royale. I was an Eagle Scout. Um, I, I had done a lot of things through my youth where um, you know, I, I got some leadership skills. And he said, you need to go apply for that job. And I went and applied, and lo and behold, I got it and spent three full summers there on the project. And uh, as it turns out, there are only two field assistants. And the role is to be looking for wolf sign, trying to find out where the dens are. Did they have wolf pups? And also doing necropsies on any moose that had died or been killed by the wolves. And that was a fantastic opportunity. Uh, while I was at Michigan Tech, I was in the minority because it's an engineering school. And uh, many of my friends are, are telling me, if you ever want to get a job, if you want to get a life, you're going to have to be an engineer. This biology thing is not going to work out for you. Uh, and, and as it turned out, I became fascinated with biomedical engineering. I had no idea that career even existed. And um, this will give you an idea of, of what a nerd I was at the time. In my free time, I'd go to the library and I'd read the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery. I just thought that was fascinating. Uh, and so uh, I was a little schizophrenic at Michigan Tech as I loved engineering. I loved wildlife biology. I ended up with a degree, as you mentioned, in mechanical engineering and biology and applied to numerous orthopedic companies, had no job offers there, but did get a job offer from Ford Motor Company Crash Safety. And so I went there still torn as to whether um, I should have pursued a life as a wildlife biologist, uh, but at that point I was, I was an engineer. So that's, that's the first step in my journey. And, um, you know, obviously, and we'll get, obviously get into a lot of the biology and the hibernation uh, science. Um, could you just take us also, uh, for those that may be less familiar with sort of the healthcare space in general or don't follow uh, medical device industry or companies like Medtronic. Could you just give us a few minute overview about Medtronic and then uh, the, the, sort of the domain that you oversee currently, cardiac ablation solutions, what that means, uh, because we might not hear, you know, we might see our, our cholesterol lowering drugs and so forth being sold on TV, but we don't too often hear about the heart valves and, and the other technologies that you specifically work on. Absolutely. So as you mentioned, Medtronic is one of the largest medical device companies. We currently treat 70 different conditions, which makes it a fascinating place to work as an engineer or a scientist because we're in the cardiac space, the neurological space. We treat diabetes. We're focused on orthopedics. And we literally have thousands of products. And it's great fun working here as a scientist and engineer because of the network of people that you get to work with. Uh, we're not at all competing with one another. Sometimes in academia, you're rushing to publish. Here, it's incredibly collaborative, and you can get on the phone with the world's experts on most any topic. My work here initially started in um, defibrillation, which is delivering high energy shocks to the heart when the rhythm is out of control. And um, oddly, I didn't do terribly well in my cardiac classes while I was at Michigan Tech. Uh, I intended to end up in orthopedics, but it, my 27-year career at Medtronic has all been in cardiac space. So initially uh, working on systems to defibrillate the heart and then moved to start the transcatheter heart valve business, which is a new approach to delivering heart valves, which has become very revolutionary. Instead of a, an open chest or a port access surgical approach, you can deliver the heart valve through a vein in the leg. Um, or an artery in the leg, and it, it expands inside the heart, and um, the valve is much like a parachute. It opens and starts functioning, and so it's a way to get a heart valve into a patient without doing a surgical approach, and as it turned out, the first product we released is called the Melody Heart Valve, and it's used in congenital heart patients who have had numerous surgeries, and, and each surgery becomes more and more risky because of all the previous scar and so this was really a, a revolutionary approach to delivering heart valve into a, a patient that had many surgeries. So I focused there uh, for a few years, then took over heart valve um, research and development, 
which is repair and replacement of heart valves, mm -hmm. and then moved into my current role in electrophysiology, which is cardiac ablation solutions. And what electrophysiology is, is mapping the electrical activity of the heart. And specifically when there's an abnormal rhythm, determining where it's emanating from. And then strangely, you kill the tissue associated with the bad behaving cells. Uh, and a good example of that is atrial fibrillation, which mm -hmm. afflicts millions of Americans and uh, is a cause for many people to be on anticoagulants, which ties to the bear research. I'll get to that a little bit later. Sure. But in these patients, the four veins that um, enter the left atrium, the left side of the heart, often will uh, be firing spontaneously and erratically. And then they put the heart into an atrial fibrillation, which is a, an uncontrolled rhythm. The upper chambers of the heart aren't beating properly. You end up with an erratic rhythm in the ventricles and a high stroke risk. So it, the typical approach there and uh, one of the products we have is a cryo balloon, which goes into each of the pulmonary veins in sequence and creates a, a ring of scar so that these badly behaving cells can't communicate with the heart. Mm. And uh, my current role is focused on electrophysiology, primarily technology scouting and managing our intellectual property portfolio within this business. Excellent. Um, now, obviously, you know, I'm, most of my career was spent in the pharmaceutical industry and, and a lot of sort of the history of my industry was based on natural products. Uh, look, you know, many of the drugs still have their origins from plants and microbes and fungi. Uh, obviously in your industry, the pig was a very important source of uh, sort of scaffolding for heart valves. Um, but now we're seeing, as, as in the work you're doing now with the, the, uh, the Bayer Project uh, and uh, an understanding that there's so much more out there in nature that we, we can still learn. And, and uh, uh, reading through some of your material, you have uh, this wonderful organism, the, the, the bear, that it, it sleeps a very long time and it doesn't lose uh, its muscle or, or, or function. I've, I looked through some of the other papers you were involved in. It has some very interesting blood clotting uh, ability, unique wound healing process. Uh, walk us through a little bit about, um, obviously you had this interest for a long time. Um, the, the project in general, I see that you're connected with University of Minnesota, a uh, Scandinavian group, the Smithsonian. Uh, walk us through sort of the, the nature of the whole project and some of the uh, therapeutic uh, connections, the things that are obvious for your current business that you're most excited about moving forward. Absolutely. And, and um, my life is still a bit schizophrenic. Uh, Medtronic, I'm focused on treating arrhythmias. And uh, most of the wild, actually all the wildlife work is through my appointment at the University of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. uh, and Medtronic doesn't have specific interests in the results of those studies sure. other than their, their commitment to science and advancing our knowledge. Yep. And so they've been very generous in um, allowing me to spend time doing this research uh, with the university, also donating devices. But as, as a, a little bit of history, I've been very fortunate in that now I'm able to live both of my dreams, which is to be an engineer and to be a wildlife biologist. Yep. And um, after I left, Michigan Tech, I continued to do some work with Earthwatch where I would lead um, wolf moose projects and, and groups out in the woods and came to Medtronic and still is doing that a bit. And uh, importantly, I met Dr. Paul Isio of the Visible Heart Lab. And we co-founded that lab 20 some years ago. Paul was incredibly interested in the outdoors and he had been invited to participate in a project to understand how bears can survive the winter without loss of muscle strength. And um, I had taken him along on a, a wolf project trip, and he invited me to come on the project with the bears. And as it turns out, on the bear project, they had a PhD student that was working on a heart monitor that uh, up and left. And because of my ties to Medtronic, the, the crew there, Hank Harlow, who is the, the principal investigator, asked if Medtronic could help with building heart monitors to place in these bears. We had a project going on. We were building heart monitors for another application. And so we, we built a few additional ones. And back in 99, uh, put a subset of these into the hibernating black bears. And that really started the journey where um, the more work we did, the more mysteries we uncovered in this uh, really miraculous model of physiology. Things that you would think are not 
uh, possible in a human, the bears readily, readily do. And there's so many examples of that in the wild kingdom, but the bears are what we've been focused on uh, for the most, most of the past 20 years. And uh, just as a, a side note uh, to that, because you know, mentioned uh, in, in some of the work, obviously you're studying these different um, sort of biologic capabilities. And one of the things you've done is you, you were just saying you, you fit uh, the monitor and so on. Are there, I happen to have sort of talked to a few people in, in, on previous shows that work with what, what we'll call the mega fauna. This is, uh, into the show, someone works with rhinoceroses and trying to mm. impregnate them and so forth. Um, this is not mice and, and rabbits and guinea pigs. Um, issues with regard to working with a bear, uh, obviously, you know, they're not that happy when they, I don't know if you, anest you know, how the whole process, can you sort of walk in what, what's involved in putting a, a cardiac monitor on a bear, uh, how you not get mauled, you have to obviously very, Absolutely. very careful with how you anesthetize them and all that so you don't kill them. Take us through sort of the technical stuff there. Yeah, and, and um, my journey is, is so much about the people I've met along the way. And there are experts, Dave Garcellas from the, the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, has tranquilized and handled uh, more than a thousand bears. And we were fortunate to start collaborating 15 years ago or so. And um, incredibly professional, um, understands their behavior. And over time you become um, comfortable in the field. And so it's not a situation with the black bears where we're ever afraid. You just have to be smart, respectful of the animal. Absolutely. Um, one of the miracles of hibernation, I think, is that um, a hibernating bear remains alert. Okay. which is surprising because you, you, uh, you see the cartoons of Yogi right. the bear sleeping <laughs> and the bears are unaware of their surroundings. If a bear was unaware of its surroundings, it would make an easy meal for a wolf. Um, the female bears give birth to cubs during the winter. They have to remain alert during hibernation and take care of these cubs. And so uh, with the bears, what's typically done is they're caught in a barrel trap the radio collar is fitted and then they're released. This is happening in the summer. And that radio collar is then used to locate their winter dens. Uh, and then we approach the den slowly. Typically, Dr. Garcellus does the tranquilization. We've been fortunate enough to, to be able to do it once in a while, which is quite exciting. But generally, Dave does it because he's, he's the pro. And um, we're all very quiet, very calm, try to get the, the animal uh, tranquilized the least disruptive manner possible, realizing that the, the bear has since woken up and is not pleased that someone is at the den site. Uh, but the tranquilization occurs and then we take the bear out of the den and we very quickly perform a variety of studies. Uh, and I can talk a bit more about those. Sure. Working with the grizzly bears, uh, which they refer to as brown bears in Europe, Americans are used to the grizzly terminology. Sure. It's not safe to be on the ground or to approach a grizzly den. <laughs> and so those, the bears there are tranquilized from a helicopter. Um, okay. I've done some work on the ground with them, but those are in juvenile bears. And the rough rule of thumb is um, five years of age or younger, it's safe to approach the den. Uh, above five years, it's just, it's simply not. And so um, number one concern is the safety of the animal. And then of course, safety of the crew is, is paramount as well. But very respectful of that. The grizzlies are then uh, tranquilized from helicopters generally. And then uh, once tranquilized, the devices we're using are quite small and um, the current version is injectable. And so you essentially just uh, shave a small spot on the skin. There's a tool that makes a nick. And then it, this device injects under the skin and um, for human use, which these devices are designed for, you simply put a Band-Aid uh, over the top of the wound and the bears will throw a couple of stitches just to make sure that it, it doesn't um, uh, come out inadvertently. And then uh, once the devices are in, they have a three-year life. We've got some telemetry stations we place out in the woods in certain circumstances, but um, then the bears are, are off on their own and, and we don't need to see them or handle them again um, per the design of the device for up to 400 days without losing data. And so it, it's given us a lot more insight into what's happening under natural circumstances. It's whenever you're handling an animal like that, uh, their behavior and physiology is, is not 
what would it would be in a normal situation. And so that that's the general process. Um, uh, but it's it's working with professionals. The team in Scandinavia has done this hundreds of times as well. Um, and we all have our different roles on the project. I, I'm more the biomedical engineer, physiologist. Uh, and then there are people that are the handlers, those that tranquilize. We always have veterinarians in the field in, in Scandinavia and sometimes in Minnesota. Uh, but it's exciting, but typically not dangerous. Yeah. And, and obviously, you're still here. So <laughs> that, that's and, good. Um, I'll say one other thing is it's, um, as was the case with my parents, we, we did many things as a family. And my, uh, my wife and three daughters love coming out in the field, especially when the females have cubs. When we're working on the females, we don't tranquilize the cubs, and so someone has to hold the cubs. Mm. And we have a long list of volunteers that are happy to hold uh, bear cubs. They're, uh, they're quite cuddly, as you can imagine. I, I can imagine. Uh, I'll leave that to those folks. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Tim, as you know, obviously you're you're heavily focused on the uh, the cardiovascular component of this, and I, which is as as we've spoken on previous shows, still you know, up there, number one number one killer around the world. Um, but then there's all this other interesting biology. Um, you, you know, you mentioned uh, some of the the neuro stuff. The uh, with regard to, okay, we're sleeping, but we're aware. Um, there's a lot that goes on with the, with the metabolic side and this thing makes you think of diabetes. Um, to the extent you could talk about this, not, nothing confidential, but any interesting mechanisms of action that you're finding, anything surprising as you're beginning to look at the biology, whether it's uh, uh, neural or, or uh, liver, kidney, whatever that may... Uh, mm -hmm show some interesting clues for other forms of development, other therapeutic niches. Yeah, absolutely. And um, nothing that we do in the bear research do we consider confidential. Now that's an important aspect of that. We're, we're scientists, we're sharing anything and everything we learn. Got it. And we do try to publish to, to keep an interest in our studies, but that's that's all public knowledge. And okay. happy to answer any questions. Sure. A couple of things that I, I think are most notable. One, the heart rhythms are quite different than what you would expect in a human patient. Uh, if your heart was to stop for five, six or seven seconds, you would pass out. What we're finding in these bears is they have, um, both in black and grizzly bears, there are periods where their heart will stop for more than 30 seconds without a beat. And then when they breathe, they'll have three or four beats to move the oxygenated blood and then their heart rests again. So it's a really interesting model of minimizing the amount of energy that the heart uses to move oxygenated blood mm. around the body. And clearly it's enough to maintain adequate perfusion to the brain so they can stay alert. Um, and so the ability to have these long periods of time without a heartbeat and remain alert, and also to have a heart that's relatively inactive and is not producing clots that could then result in a stroke is quite interesting as well. So the, the, the slow heart rhythms we've thought about as potential treatments for heart failure. Mm -hmm. If you have a patient that needs to have their heart rested uh, to minimize the stress on it, you can mimic the, um, the rhythm of a bear. And you can do that by stimulating the phrenic nerve, which can cause the, the heart to pause, or sorry, the, the vagus nerve. You stimulate the vagus nerve. You can create long pauses in the heart. You stop stimulation, ventilate the patient, and then stimulate again. That's a way that you could minimize the amount of heartbeats that a, a patient has they're in a, um, a sick or ambulatory situation. The other thing that's great, um, quite mysterious and interesting is the fact they go through this period of roughly five months in the den. Um, they're not eating, they're not drinking, they're sedentary, there's very little room to move, yet they come out in the spring and have maintained the vast majority of the muscle strength. And so how they do that isn't quite clear. Whether it's related somehow to circulating proteins, there's um, a thought that it might relate to stretch receptors, mm -hmm. where the human body knows if you're using your muscles or not because of stress re stretch receptors. If the stretch receptors aren't being stimulated or stressed, then they assume that muscle isn't required and it's, and it's uh, catabolized. Uh, it could be that they shut that mechanism off. 
so that their body doesn't know they're not using these muscles. Uh, there is some activity. We see that they roll over periodically. Um, they shiver, of course, to stay warm. But that's another mechanism that we, we'd very much like to understand. And one of the most recent has been a, a focus of Dr. Tina Niles' work, who is on our team. And she's looked at the clotting cascade in the hibernating bears. And what we found is that a hibernating bear has blood that is anticoagulated mm. in a similar manner to a patient that was going to have heart surgery. Okay. So during heart surgery or cardiac catheterization, they'll heparinize you. And there's um, a metric called the activated clotting time, ACT. And it, it looks at how long it takes for your blood to clot. In a patient that's undergoing surgery or cardiac catheterization, you'll thin their blood until they have an activated clotting time of about 300 seconds. Okay. What we found is that's about the time it takes for clot, uh, blood clots to form in a hibernating bear. During the summer, it's normal and similar to human, which might be 80 seconds, but in the winter, it's, it's long. What's really intriguing is that they don't have a high bleeding risk. Uh, both both my parents and my brother, uh, my, my parents, uh, one for AF, one for a clotting disorder, my brother for a clotting disorder, they're all on blood thinners. Mm. And when you're on a blood thinner, your stroke risk goes down, but now you have a very high bleeding risk. For the bears, they don't have a high stroke risk and they don't have a high bleeding risk. And I think if we could discover the mechanism behind that, that could be one of the, the mis most disruptive things that could come out of this research. It would really revolutionize how we treat patients with both uh, blood clotting disorders and atrial fibrillation and other situations that put them at risk for stroke. Outstanding. Fascinating work. Nature has a lot to give us. Uh, it does. Really, really impressive work. Um, you know, separate from, from was your day job and then obviously all this work, you've been doing a lot of um, lecturing on, on innovation and STEM. Um, could you, obviously you have the, the R&D role, but you're also a business development guy. Um, any interesting insights, advice for uh, the, the startup companies, the, the young innovators that may be watching, whether it has to do with... Uh, uh, coming to, uh, you know, a Dr. Tim Lasky with a new invention, um, the sort of the, the valley of death situation in early stage biotech, and any interesting insights that you're out there lecturing about that you could share with us and some of those viewers. Absolutely. And um, that's another part about my job that I love. I'm, I'm very much uh, energized by innovation, and uh, that's being responsible for intellectual property for the business is, is one of the funnest parts of my job. Also the technology scouting and, and talking to startup companies. There are so many situations where I'll hear an idea from a startup and my first thought is, hmm, I'm not sure that's a good idea. That doesn't really make sense. But what I've learned is smart people understand things that I don't <laughs> and that I always maintain an open mind. It's like, let's go talk to them and see why they think this is a good idea. And Invariably, I learned something along the way. And that one of the lessons is really look at where you can provide radical improvements in clinical value. In the end, it's all about clinical value. Um, at Medtronic, we're looking to re restore health, uh, extend life, uh, alleviate pain, look for ways that we can help our patients. And so if you're really focused on how do you better serve patients and healthcare providers, and then worry about everything else later. You can't ignore the fact that you need to raise money, but pursue ideas that are really going to provide incremental value. And if they indeed do, then you will be able to secure funding, you'll find partners. Um, and it's important that you don't get too enamored with your, your own ideas. Uh, Todd Brenton, who was at Stanford Biodesign, he said one of the um, uh, most important failure modes of a startup company is falling in love with your own idea. And so you need to step back and be objective and say, is this really a good idea? What are the risks associated with it? What are the, the critical issues I have to address? What will the critics say? And then let's burn down those, those risks early. And if we can't, maybe it's not a good idea. But looking for um, unique clinical value, something importantly you can protect, um, so you need to be careful to, to uh, secure intellectual property around your idea. 
because that's a, that's a way that you can defend your idea. And then um, look for partners and smart people. Too many people try to work in a vacuum, don't want to tell anybody about their idea. You need to be cautious in that regard, but find people that complement your, your skills. Um, I know your background is in pharmacy. So if you're, you're pursuing something, find people with backgrounds in engineering and business and science, physiology, how to run clinical studies, uh, how to manage different regulatory agencies mm -hmm. and bring that team together. And, and we look not only at, at the unique clinical value, but who's on the team. Yep. And um, the credibility of the team says a lot. And who are the investors and who's on their scientific advisory board? These are smart people and they, um, they can sense when there's a good idea and when there's not. And their time is incredibly valuable. I think for you, I, and many others, the, the most precious commodity we have is our time. And if people are willing to apply time towards a project someone's working on, that's often a signal that that is something intriguing. Um, the let, I guess I could talk about this all day, uh, but one other thing is, is find something that you love. Um, you might find something that's interesting and provides clinical value, but you're not, if you're not passionate about it, Mm -hmm. It's really difficult to stay energized and to work ridiculously hard. Um, and, I, and this is a, a bit of an aside, but I was one Saturday morning, I was on my laptop uh, working on a, a journal article. And my daughter, who was a teenager at the time, said, Dad, I really don't want to work as hard as you when I grow up. <laughs> and I looked at her because I, I didn't realize I was working. Like, I'm not working. I'm writing a paper. And... And if, you, um, if your life is like that, where it just doesn't feel like work, it's what you want to do and it's what you think about. When I'm out fishing, I'm thinking about projects. Um, I try to get my family involved. And so the, the more that you can weave it into your life so that you're really, really committed to it, um, the greatest innovators in the world have had numerous failures. Yep. Uh, but then they learn from those failures and they just can continue to persist. You have to realize at what point, okay, maybe I have to set this down for a while or maybe it just will never work. But it's amazing how persistence can beat even the most difficult problems into submission. And that's where the big breakthroughs come from. It's hard work and takes a lot of passion and often professional risk because people will tell you you're crazy, that's a bad idea. Uh, and you, you have to be willing to continue to stick your neck out at times and, and pursue what you believe in. So as you can probably tell from my animated tone that I'm, I'm quite excited about that. No, that's a, we, we need more of that. Uh, we need more of that for, for everybody out there with, that's, uh, that's interested in, in radical innovation and, and you know, what, what's the right way to get stuff done and what's not. And I appreciate that insight. Um, taking it down one level from that um, to the even younger audience that we, we routinely get contacted by um, a senior in high school, freshman in college, not really sure they're going to hear this. They'd be like, wow, um, I, I want to work with Dr. Tim Lasky one day. I want to, I want to be Dr. Tim Lasky uh, 10 years from now and what he's doing. Um, obviously no, no <laughs> ultra specific stuff, but, uh, you know, you're an engineer, you're a biomedical engineer. Um, what do you recommend nowadays to people just starting out so the sciences? Do you recommend the MBA? Um, Walk yeah. some of the younger folks through some suggestions. Yeah, that's a, a, a great question. And um, a solid education is is critically important. Um, it doesn't mean you know if you want to be if you want to work on cars, go to trade school, get some skills on that. Maybe you decide you want to expand that into engineering, but, but develop skills so that you can bring something unique to any particular situation. And then uh, the passion, of course, is important and networking. Start to find out who does what you're interested in. I talk to students all the time and the ones that really uh, set themselves apart are the ones that have they've taken more initiative. They volunteered on projects. They're willing to do most anything they can to get their foot in the door. And there's others that um, will want to um, go to school, get an MBA, and suddenly be a corporate executive. It really doesn't work that way. Because you, you've got to build up your experience. Uh, you may be able to start up your own company in something small, but, but 
the path that I always recommend is, is start building your skill set. Get your toolkit put together. Get a basic education. Um, I've got my PhD, but I had no intention of ever doing that. <laughs> After I finished my undergrads, I thought, that's it. I am so tired of school. I'm not going to do that anymore. And then um, I think at times you forget you know, how much work it might have been. Sure. And I was at Ford. It became clear that if I wanted to be one of the more senior engineers, I needed a master's degree. And so I got that part-time. And then I came to Medtronic, and my general manager, who's Dale Wallstrom, is one of my greatest mentors, um, we talked about what it would take to be a technical leader within the, the medical device industry. And he said, you either are in all likelihood going to need either an MD or a PhD. Mm. And so I got my PhD when I was in my 30s. And so um, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. And, and people often feel that if they don't know what they want to do right away and they're not going to school for the right degree, that there's something wrong. Uh, I tell students, if you've secure your dream job by the time you're 40, you're going to probably work for 30 years. <laughs> I was thinking last night about talking to you today and I think, okay, what am I going to do for the next 20 years? I thought, well, I'm going to be pretty old in 20 years, but as long as I'm physically able, I'm going to continue to do the wildlife research and mentoring. And so um, shadow people, volunteer in labs, um, do anything you can to start building up your resume. Uh, my youngest daughter is interested in wildlife biology. Uh, I have three daughters. They're all fantastic. And I keep telling them, you know, skills. I have one daughter is in Paris and said, you need to learn French. You need to leave Paris <laughs> learning French, right? <laughs> yeah. Another daughter works in a psychiatric ward and she wants to go to graduate school. Like, just keep, keep building up your skill set, network, and find people um, that can honestly can help you along the way. Um, and I, I'll I use an example when we're at a bear den. Mm -hmm. So many people want to come along on the bear research. And many of them just want to hold bear cubs. Right. So it's very different when a student comes and as soon as the cubs are out, they disappear and you never see them again because they're off holding bear cubs versus a student that's there and said, hey, can I carry your backpack? They're asking questions about what you're doing. How can I help? That's the type of student you go, hmm. I want to work with that student. I'm going to help that student because uh, we all had so much help along the way yep. that you find someone that's motivated like that. And you go, okay, this is someone I will really want to invest my time in. So you shouldn't be afraid to talking to, uh, to talk to people that are in the career you want to end up in or uh, doing something you want to do. Cause invariably I am only here because I've been helped by hundreds and thousands of people to get here. And I want to be able to pay that forward. So so get the experience and think about, um, kind of the final thing I would say is, think about why they would hire you or why you would um, be best positioned for that job. Because there are a lot of people, for example, in wildlife, uh, so many people would love to be a professional wildlife biologist. Okay, well, why would you become one and not the other thousand people that want to? Right. Uh, and you can. You just have to say, okay, well, I know I'm going to have to work my way through. I'll probably have to get a PhD. I'm going to have to work on several um, projects. And the project work, like the wildlife, the wolf moose work was fantastic. I got paid minimum wage, but what an amazing job. I, there was nowhere I could spend money. I was out in the woods. The only money I spent was on uh, sending film in to get developed. Uh, but get that experience and don't be in too big of a hurry. And just reach out and uh, show people that you are truly interested and you're willing to do what it takes. And one more of that, um, you know, at the beginning of the show, you, you, you mentioned the, the importance of your family. Uh, you just mentioned uh, one of your, your mentors, Adele Wallstrom. Uh, any other folks that you might wanna mention, shout out to at this point that were extremely instrumental in, in everything that you've become and uh, in, in, in what you're doing now? Yeah, absolutely. I could I could run through a quick list of, of people that were Take your time. really uh, Mr. Gardner for math in high school, Mr. Hoy, my scoutmaster, incredibly patient. Um, then I went to Isle Royal and uh, Rolf Peterson, who was one of my heroes, and his wife Candy. Rolf is a, a famous wolf biologist, and I lived with their family while I was out there in the summers. Had a, a profound impact on my life uh, coming to Medtronic, of course, Dale Wallstrom 
and uh, Paul Izio. I mentioned my parents, of course. My wife and, and daughters are incredibly patient with me. I can be a bit manic, but I try to uh, try to get them involved in things. Uh, one thing I'd say to the, the aspiring uh, young female innovators, my last three general managers have all been women. One was a pharmacist, one was a business major, and my current one is an engineer. Uh, and they're all running uh, a very large business with very diverse backgrounds. And so, you know, everyone should dream big on these things. Uh, and Rebecca Seidel is my current GM and she's just fantastic. And uh, one of the reasons I'm sticking in this business is I like working with her and some of my best friends are on this team. And so that, that's a kind of a quick run through of people that have really had a profound impact. There, um, uh, I could literally go on and on. I have so many friends that are so much brighter and more successful than I am but they tolerate my presence, which is fun. <laughs> um, so that, that's kind of a few of the mentors, but find people that'll support you in your career. And, um, and truly my best friends are at work and the people I do the wildlife research with. Excellent. Uh, so one, one final, final question. Uh, and this, you know, as people watch the show know, I, I usually give the bio of our guests to, I have three kids over here too. Uh, I have one son that's uh, he's crazy about uh, anything that has to do with space. Uh, and he obviously threw the obvious question at me and, you know, I have to give it to you. Uh, obviously, you're learning a lot about clotting and heart rhythms and so forth. But uh, anything in the hibernation sciences related to, you know, getting us up there for space journeys and, and future and sort of that, how we can fall asleep and wake up two years from now on Pluto or wherever. Yeah, and, it, and, it, um, and it, it's in some cases, we definitely try not to oversell this, but the things you can learn from a hibernating bear, for example, how do you, when someone goes on long-term space travel, some of the complications are uh, muscle okay. disuse atrophy. And actually the, the heart will decrease in size pretty rapidly. Even two weeks in the space okay. station, you'll see a 10% decrease in cardiac mass. And so how do we, we put someone in space, prevent the disuse atrophy, prevent atrophy of the heart, prevent the risk of a stroke? Um, if you're imagining you're, you're hibernating, the bears can recycle urea so that they don't need to urinate. Um, they can go long periods without water. So how do you prevent dehydration? There's a lot of things that if you need to keep someone in a, a very low metabolic state for an extended period of time, there's things we can learn about a bear. And we wouldn't, um, I'm not proposing we're, we're anywhere close to hibernating a human, but being able to reduce the metabolism yeah. of an astronaut so that they can endure space travel for a longer period of time and maintain alertness while they're in this, this low metabolic state, maintain muscle strength is uh, something that it certainly is in the future. Right. Some of the early work uh, was funded partially by NASA. Mm. The University of Wyoming work, and so it's um, it's on the forefront of people's minds. It is now um, they've discovered the fat-tailed lemur hibernates, so there are primates that hibernate. Um, humans that have seasonal affective disorder mm. have a heart rhythm that is similar, uh, more similar to a hibernating bear mm. than patients that do not. They have this pronounced respiratory sinus arrhythmia where the heart rate cycles more with breathing than a patient yeah. without seasonal affective disorder. And it likely relates to their, um, their parasympathetic tone or how their, their heart-brain connection is working. So there, there are indications that um, maybe there's some remnants of hibernation in humans, or certainly if a primate can, human, uh, can hibernate, maybe it's not so crazy to think that you, you might be able to mimic a similar situation in a human. Really fascinating, amazing, amazing stuff you're doing, Tim. And I, it's uh, I really wishing you the best with all this moving forward. That's the next twenty years or however long you're going to be working on it. Up, it's uh, uh, really, really fascinating. And um, just want to thank you for 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 doing this uh, again. Um, for everybody that uh, is going to be listening to this episode on the podcast or watching 
uh, on the YouTube network. You've been listening to Dr. Tim Lasky, uh, Vice President of Research and Business Development, uh, Cardiac Ablation Solutions Division of the Medtronic Corporation, Medtronic Bakken Fellow, Technical Fellow, Fellow of the American Institute for Medical and Biological Engineering, and major thought leader at the Minnesota Black Bear Research Project. Uh, Tim, thank you for, for once again taking the time out of your schedule to, to talk with us. Uh, thank you for everything you're doing. And, and as we say, uh, thank you for helping to create a better tomorrow for all of us for your work. It's, it's, it's absolutely amazing. All right. Most importantly, believe in yourself, people. That's a great <laughs> message. Thanks for that. <laughs>